I'm Holly. And I'm Bridget. And this is Girls Next Level. <laughs> Welcome back to Girls Next Level. Sorry, I didn't ask you if you were ready. I w- no, I'm like, wait, what are we even, what are we recording? <laughs> um, career Days Part 1. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at the ads. Oh, oh no. I was ready no. to do ads. Career days part one. Wait, okay. Let me switch. Let me switch. <laughs> All right, you guys. Thank you for joining us. Today we are talking about Girls Next Door season two, episode three. This is called Career Dazed. And this episode first aired on August 6th, 2006. And I'm going to take you guys back in time a little bit. Wait, let me start this completely over because I didn't ask you about your trip. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) So Bridget just came back from this big old trip to Greece and I haven't even asked her about it because it's the first time I'm seeing her. I just got back. Um, I still feel like I'm kind of in a whirlwind of it all. It was absolutely incredible. It felt like it felt like one of those places where you were you felt like you have to keep pinching yourself to see if you're really there oh I thought you were gonna say where it feels like you've been there in a past life no no (laughs) I just it was like so unbelievable the little cobblestone streets like in Mykonos and then in Santorini everything's on this cliff side like I can't I have to show you a video of how we even had to get to our room down this little tiny cliffside stairs and and then you just look at all of these buildings that are built along that cliff side and it's so crazy that sounds so cute it's really cute and the views are incredible and we had that cave pool and there was a mm-hmm. full moon with that view and the oh moon God, and our so pool cool. it was amazing but a couple of uh, everything was like just so incredible until the very very end what happened so I got sick at the end but uh, the biggest thing is that somebody at the Mykonos airport went through my bag, like rummaged through my bag and stole my shoes. Wait, what? Yeah. Stole, I had a brand new pair of Air Force Ones, gone. That is random and specific. Yeah, well, they went through my bathroom stuff too, I can tell, because they left it all open and like, so we got to London and we had a really long layover in London. Uh And so we got a hotel room at the airport, the Sofitel there, and... So when we got our bags and we went back to the the hotel room in London, I opened it up and I was like, what the hell happened to my bag? Because I always pack things nicely and and organized and it just looked like a a tornado was in my bag. And Nick was like, you know what? Things weren't where I left stuff in my bag either. So they totally went through all our shit. And at first I was like, "I, I don't know. Like I was just confused. Like I wasn't even looking for anything missing or anything like that. I was just confused. Then the next day I went to go put my shoes on to do the, the, 10 and a half hour flight from London to LA and my shoes were gone. That sucks, but at least it's the tail end of your flight though. Cause sometimes you only pack just enough that you need to like have cute outfits and that would suck if they had been missing that whole time. Yeah. Well, I plan to wear them on that flight home oh, <laughs> with dude. my sweats and my that sweatshirt. Is harsh. Yeah. So I'm not happy about it. Like, cause I mean, I think it's the Libra in me. Like Nick's like, you just have to let it go, Bridget. There's nothing you can do about it. And I'm like, no oh no. I would be happy about this. <laughs> I'm not letting this go. I'm not letting this go. First of all, they're very, very, very superstitious over there. Everything is blue eye. Everything. And when you walk down the halls, the everything evil is blue eye. eye. So I am putting the evil eye on whoever did this. So do they it. better hope they have a ton of blue eyes on them. <laughs> it just sucks because we had such an incredible trip. And everybody was so amazing in Greece. Like the people were so friendly. The food was incredible. The scenery, like everything was amazing. And then to have that happen at the end. Rude. Mm-hmm. I don't like it. Yeah. But the rest of the trip was amazing. Incredible. You have to post more grid pictures. We saw some amazing stories. Yeah. Gotta put yeah. some stuff on the grid now. Yeah, I'll try. <laughs> I'm so bad about You're it. Like, oh, right. Post the shoes. Do like an in memoriam. You need to put a post on your grid that's like in memoriam and do like the dates that you had them. Like a tombstone of sorts. <laughs> Please do it. <laughs> uh, I will have to see if I even have and a picture of And then put the of evil them. eye. <laughs> I will. I will. 
So Career Dazed, Girls Next Door, Season 2, Episode 3, first aired on August 6th, 2006. We're going to jump in our time machine and go back. The number one song was Still Promiscuous by Nelly Furtado. And the number one alternative song was Miss Murder by AFI. Love that song. The number one movie was Talladega Nights, The Ballad of Ricky Bobby. That's you remember funny. that one? We of watched course, it at the yes. mansion for sure. Yeah. I remember back then Leslie Bibb, who was the lead in that movie, she did a Maxim pictorial, but she did the interview in character. So she answered all the questions as the character, and it was really funny. Should we talk a little bit about Maxim? Because I feel like that was such a thing, and it was kind of like Playboy adjacent back then. Right. And it's significant because Playboy felt so threatened by Maxim. I know. Which is funny now, because like, does Maxim even still exist? I don't know if it does. If it does, it's not relevant. Sorry. But um, Maxim used to be like the biggest men's magazine that like all the celebrities wanted to pose for. And there were other like kind of knockoff or lesser versions of Maxim like FHM or stuff but Maxim was the big one and Playboy felt so threatened by Maxim yeah it was like a thing yeah and if other if playmates wanted to pose for it it was like a a thing yeah it was like a no-no or if somebody wanted to get in Playboy kind of an easy way to like nudge Playboy into making that decision was having your manager say well you know they're offered a Maxim cover next month so which is it gonna be I know somebody who was like not a big celebrity but got a cover that was kind of a bigger thing than she should have got at the time it, just based on her level of celebrity beautiful woman but just based on her level of celebrity and I know because I kind of overheard parts of the conversation in the office that the reason she got it is because the manager said oh well she has a possible Maxim cover so which is going to be and personally I don't believe it I think it was like a smart tactic from that manager yeah at one point I think they even hired an editor away from Maxim to come to Playboy and like revamp Playboy, but I don't think it went very far. Oh, really? I didn't know. Yeah, it was right around the time of the 50th anniversary. It's just hard because Playboy's like nudity and that has a stigma and Maxim didn't have that stigma. So like all the celebrities were doing it. Right. So it's like you kind of can't really compete. So this is not like my favorite episode of the season. It's one of my least favorites. We'll get into why. But the irony is back when this episode was new, it was one of my favorites because I felt like, oh my God, they're finally showing us doing stuff on our own. And I believe this is the first episode that Kevin would call a Frankenstein episode, meaning it wasn't all three of us doing something together. It was like a bunch of completely separate things we were all doing separately, but kind of merged together with a common theme. And those Frankenstein episodes would become more common as we go on down the line. Mm -hmm. But this was probably the first of them. And I think that's why I liked it so much back then is like, oh my God, we kind of finally get to be able to do our own things, you know? Yeah, well, kind of. Kind of. It's a, it's a small start. Could have been better, especially. And I think I'm also like when I hate on it now, it's because I'm taking the title too seriously. I'm like, oh, it's called Career Dazed, but you don't really show us doing career stuff. And we'll get yeah. into all that. I think that's what bothers me about it. Too. Yeah, we're both kind of like bitter over it now. Like, Ugh, it's not really career. <laughs> yeah. Whose career was that? Exactly. <laughs> So the cold open is us shooting Scary Movie 4 in Vancouver, which we talked a little bit about. I think when we talked about it before, though, we didn't really get into, even though we were only there for one night, what a fun trip that was. It was. And you know what else, before we move on to, mm-hmm. it, that I think is interesting, is that this is one of the first, or the first episode that I've noticed that it doesn't start at the mansion somehow. It starts oh, right. literally on the set of the movie. Mm-hmm. Which I think is really interesting. Yeah. And I'm assuming they must have asked the production for some kind of B-roll. Because the girls next door wasn't with us. Were they? I thought they were. They let them on set? That's crazy. Now I'm second guessing. Yeah. It's interesting because we were called in to do this cameo for Scary Movie 4. And I think the theme of this episode when we're talking about it today, is going to be like the slow burn of fame. Because I think a lot of people are curious about fame and like the different avenues and the different experiences. And we were never like mega stars, so we can't give you like that perspective. But our unique perspective was we were stars of this cable show that was really, really popular. But I feel like getting popular on a cable show is kind of like a slower rise to recognition than say if you were on like 
something on Fox, like The Simple Life, or even MTV was good at creating like those breakout stars with like Jersey Shore and Laguna Beach and things like that. But I feel like on E! it took a couple seasons for everybody to know your name. Even with the Kardashians, like nobody really knew Chloe and Courtney until like a couple seasons in. Well, I feel like it was extra hard for us too because we were just the Playboy girls or Hef's girlfriends or arm candy for so long. And we were sheltered. Like Playboy wouldn't let us do any of our own press, any of our own outside things, any extra opportunities we got like Scary Movie for. It was because that went through Playboy and that was approved by Hef and Playboy. They thought it was beneficial enough to them. And it's interesting that we were cast as a joke in this movie and for the joke to work it goes on the assumption that people have to know who we are but I never even felt that famous especially in season two right and it no, never occurred to me back so then yeah it never occurred to me back then but like for the joke to work people have to know who we are that we're all dating the same guy and I didn't feel like we were that famous back then I mean does it work if they don't know too though like if they just see three women popping out of bed with Charlie yeah Sheen? I guess you're right it's still funny especially since it's Charlie Sheen and he has a reputation yeah like I think it still works mm-hmm it's just um, it's like an extra wink if you happen to know right because I definitely didn't feel so famous that I thought everybody who would see a major movie would know who we were right and I don't know how distorted our perception of that was because we were so sheltered so as we go through this episode I'm going to ask you more because you might know a little bit more because I feel like you were a little more out and about than I was in the real world not a lot yeah but we'll, we'll see if we're on the same yeah. page <laughs> but the trip was really fun I mean we got to go there I remember uh we flew into Vancouver mm-hmm. and we stayed at a really nice hotel yeah and then we went to um this really good Chinese food for dinner I think it was called Shanghai Bistro and it was just so good we were all just we were there with Terry Thomerson with Playboy PR and Joe Piastro with Playboy Security and we love both of those people like mm-hmm. there couldn't have been more fun better people to travel with and we were just raving about the food we loved it (laughs) it was good it was really good. good Have you ever woken up to a new acne breakout at the worst time? I know I have. I've suffered from acne since I was in like the fifth grade and I still get breakouts. The worst is when I know I have a big event the next day and I can feel them coming in sometimes. Like like the painful ones around your nose. It's the worst and you need it to clear up right away. We know acne can get in the way of feeling confident in your skin and that's why we're excited to partner with Apostrophe, the sponsor of this episode. Apostrophe is an online platform that connects you with an expert dermatology team to get customized acne treatment for your unique skin. Through Apostrophe, you can get access to oral and topical medications that use clinically proven ingredients to help clear acne. Simply fill out an online consultation about your skin goals and medical history, then snap a few selfies and a dermatology provider will create your customized treatment plan. Apostrophe offers access to prescription treatments for all types of acne, from hormonal acne to facial acne and even back, chest, and butt acne. My favorite thing about this experience is you get in touch with an expert dermatologist team. You get a tailored treatment plan unique to your skin. It's very simple. You just sign up. There's no in-person appointments or trip to the pharmacy. We have a special deal for our audience. Get your first visit for only $5 at apostrophe.com slash next level when you use your code next level. That's savings of $15. This code is only available to our listeners. To get started, just go to apostrophe.com slash next level and click get started. Then use our code next level at sign up and you'll get your first visit for only $5. Thank you to Apostrophe for sponsoring this episode. And then I remember we got massages at our hotel room Mm -hmm. late at night. And then I remember we had to be up so early. Like our call time on set was like at 5, which meant we had to get up at like, I don't know, 3.30 or 4 in the morning. And then, um, yeah, and then hair and makeup. And then we shot our things. We were done like midday. I remember walking out of the set and I remember Charlie Sheen asking us all to dinner. Yeah, you told me that. I don't remember that. I must have been like off in my head somewhere, but of course he did. (laughs) <laughs> yeah it's funny because even though like we're supposed to be Hef's girlfriends that didn't stop people from asking us out and oddly enough asking us out as a group right <laughs> 
<laughs> it's like, wouldn't that have been weird? I know. Yeah, and then we had to fly home right away. Yeah, it's crazy. And Charlie Sheen showed up on the set later than us. Like, we showed up early, hair and makeup, shot the scene, and then he came in later. Because I saved, like, our call sheet and stuff, and his call time was, like, a little bit later. And this was before, like, Charlie Sheen, I think, always had a reputation, but this was before, like, the whole winning tiger's blood era right which even that was a long time ago that was like 2010 ish i don't know if people even remember that but remember when charlie sheen was like going crazy on twitter and he's like i have tiger's blood and i'm dating all these girls and and winning hashtag winning and he was beefing with somebody i don't know who it was so he kept saying he was winning right it was weird and then didn't he get fired off two and a half men there was some whole like he was on one and it was all happening on twitter yeah i don't remember what all happened but they, they, he was definitely all in one for a little while. Yeah. <laughs> and they're cutting to your confessional interview. And this is your Cinderella interview. Oh, yes. Because you have like this blue blouse on with like kind of a peplum sleeve and like your hair is in a bun. And I'm like, it's the Cinderella cosplay. It's the Betsy Johnson dress. <laughs> In interview, you say, our role in Scary Movie 4 involved us making fun of ourselves a little bit. We wake up in the same bed and kind of try to get Charlie Sheen to get back in bed with us. And they show the she- the, the scene. I pop up from <laughs> under the covers. They show the sheen. <laughs> <laughs> I pop up from under the covers. Then Kendra pops up. Then Holly pops up. And it's funny because we're all making fun of the way his hair is blowing mm-hmm. in the wind. We got a lot of practice doing pillow fights that year. I know, right? We did pillow fights for that scene, pillow fight for our pictorial. Like if anybody knew who, how to do a photogenic pillow fight, it was us. Talk about a skill set you never knew you needed. <laughs> and then they cut to my confessional. I'm giving the most stiff interview ever. And I'm talking about how this year's been really crazy since our pictorial came out. And I know they cut to you and you reference the show, but I'm attributing our success and rise to stardom solely to our pictorial, which I think I was kind of directed to do. Because in general, like they let it through, like they let you say it. But in general, they didn't really like us acknowledging the show too much. I noticed that they let me say it. And then I also noticed they let Hef say it later, too. Oh. That our that our new found fame from the show so they're giving us a little victory lap yeah (laughs) so this episode is very much like we've already had our first two episodes which was really one episode because it was a one-hour special celebrating Hef's 80th birthday but this episode is like we're back for season two the girls have had their first successful season of this show on E so we're checking back in with them and seeing where they're at now that they're quote-unquote famous and have all these opportunities right so that's kind of the theme of this show not so much career yeah like I think Kevin really loved the idea of us being stars but in his own bubble and in a way that he controlled he didn't want us like running around being like stars on our own and he used to call us that he used to come to the mansion and he'd look at us and he'd do this weird like thing with his fingers and go my stars my stars (laughs) totally (laughs) totally and then one of us says All of us have got really focused on our careers. And I wrote in my notes, what? Because like, what are our careers? Like, I think from the show's perspective, our careers are like being Playboy models. But that's not really a career in and of itself. I think you and I, when we wanted to do that, we always kind of looked at that as like its own special little achievement and kind of like a stepping stone to other things. Right. Not like a full career. Yeah. Well, I know Kendra in an interview says, I just know that being in Playboy has definitely changed my life because she gets to meet all these new people and they all know who she is and that's the best feeling in the world to her. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Well, I think it had changed her life at this point more than it had changed any of our lives because at this point, she's already done a club appearance. Yeah, you need to tell me about that because I'm aware that Kendra was allowed to do things we weren't allowed to do, but I don't think I was aware of it this early on. Like when I think back to it, I think I became more aware of it later in the seasons because she didn't really like talk to us about stuff like that ever. But I do know that before this episode airs, She'd already gone and done her first club appearance and they kind of kept it from us. But obviously we know she's gone and we find out about Mm -hmm. it. And it's totally unfair because she's going to get to go. She's getting to go do something on her own. 
Making money. Making those money. those club appearances paid good. Like you'd get tens of thousands of dollars just to show up for like an hour or two. Yeah. And we weren't allowed to go and do those things. Mm-hmm. And it was sort of like, well, Kendra's special or something. Like she gets to go do these things. We have to let her sow her oats a little bit. So we have to let her do these things. And it's like, no, that's totally not okay. Well, I think she was allowed to do it because she had less of a sunken cost than we did. Like we had been through so much at that house. We'd put up with so much shit, with the bullying, the years we had been there with nothing fun going on. And when you go through all that, you have like a sunken cost feeling. Like I put so much into this, I'm less likely to abandon it. It's Mm -hmm. like a whole psychological thing. But Kendra didn't have to go through any of that. So for her, it's very much like, oh, I could give this up at any time because I didn't really have to give much up to be here or go through a lot to stay here. And I think they recognized that. And she was given so much so early because she just happened to come along only a year before the show came along. I think they always felt like, oh, Kendra could like cut and run at any time. So let's let her do these things here and there. And the only reason they don't let us do it is because they know they have more control. And that's fucked. Right. It's really fucked up. Right. So, I mean, obviously I caught on pretty quickly that she was doing these events and I'm just like, what the fuck? Like, why can't I go do events too? And they were very anti me going and doing these events and told me no, even when one came in for me. Well, I remember a really specific example. I don't think it was during season two. This was like later on when I became more aware of it is Kendra got to host a night at Pure in Las Vegas. And Pure was this club that used to pay a lot for like people to come. And then you got the same offer right after her. And the office told you, no, you're not allowed to do it because Playboy is only supposed to do stuff at the Palms. Correct. Wait, so like why did Kendra get to do it? Like that makes no sense. Exactly. So it's crazy. It is crazy. Uh, In commentary, you say, does anybody know what show Destiny is on? Do you know... And I was like, wait, what? Destiny was on a show? Oh, was it Paradise City? Oh, you know what? I think it was. Yeah, okay, so E, so this is season two. We're just starting. And another new show that E had come out that same time our season two came out was a show called Paradise City. It was set in Las Vegas. It was about like a handful of Vegas locals. And it seems like it would be a good idea for a show, but I guess it didn't take off or whatever. And I think Destiny had a small role on that show. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons when I was trying to do my spinoff, I had moved to Vegas to do a show and I was insistent that, no, I'm here. Like this is where my life is. If I'm going to do a spinoff, it's in Vegas. And for the longest time, E did not want to do it because they're like every season we get a Vegas pilot and it flops. Yeah. And it had in the past. (laughs) Yeah, 100%. You know what Rocket Money has helped me out so much with? What's that? I sometimes sign up for subscriptions or little apps and things like that because I want to use one thing on the app and then I forget about it and then I'm being nickeled and dimed to death. Oh no. But Rocket Money is so good at finding those things and they just cancel it for you. Like you don't have to figure out who to call or what to log on to or what your password was. And I love it. It makes things so easy. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Most people think they're spending $80 on their subscriptions when in reality the number is closer to 200. When you're signed up for so many things like streaming services you use to watch one show or free trials for delivery you don't use, it's so easy to lose track of what you're paying for. With Rocket Money, you can easily cancel the ones you don't want with just the press of a button. No more long hold times or annoying emails with customer service. Rocket Money does all the work for you. Rocket Money can even negotiate to lower your bills for you by up to 20%. All you have to do is take a picture of your bill and Rocket Money takes care of the rest. Rocket Money also lets you monitor all your expenses in one place, recommends custom budgets based on your past spending, and they'll even send you notifications when you've reached your spending limits. With over 3 million users and counting, Rocket Money customers have saved an average of $720 a year. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions and manage your money the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash next level. That's rocketmoney.com slash next level. rocketmoney.com slash next level. 
Yeah, so then the, in my interview, I say, with the success of the show and our pictorials, things have just blown up. And it shows me sitting on my bed and I'm signing autographs. What were those for? I saw that huge stack of autographs you had. And I remember we were asked quite regularly to sign these stacks of Playboy promo photos but I don't know where they went so I say later thank God because I can't remember Uh either but in commentary I say that we signed all those photos for a conference we were going to in Barcelona so it was for all the people that Playboy conference in Barcelona remember at the at that amazing um it was like a the really cool Gaudi building right Yeah. yeah so cool we're saying all kinds of things like Playboy wants us to do press. And I feel like that's a lot of the reason I kind of give a side eye when I'm thinking of this episode as a career episode is it's not really about our careers. It's about us doing as much press for Hef and his brand. Like that's a full-time job. Not that I didn't mind doing that to an extent. Like some press was miserable, some I didn't mind doing. But it's not really about our careers. It's more about like, oh, now you, you're, you've you got a lot more stuff you can do for Playboy now. I continue to say we are just so busy. Things are exploding all around us and it has been nothing but fun. I mean, and then I say, I mean, I always thought of if I became Playmate, that was like topping out on the goal category, but, and that I couldn't go any higher than that. I mean, what's next? But I found out that there was a whole other level out there. I want to ask you a little more about how famous or not famous you felt at this time period because I think in the beginning one of us says people recognize us is that true did you feel like you were recognized when you were going out and about it's kind of a different gauge to talk about when you live in LA because people are so used to seeing TV people around that they don't really freak out the way they would in like other parts of the country but did you feel like people recognized you not at this point I don't think I don't think so either I feel like when we say it It's because we're in this episode. It's because we know the producers want us to say stuff like this. Well, it depends, too. When we're doing our autograph signings, obviously Mm -hmm. people recognize us. Like, they know who we are. Mm -hmm. So in in that capacity, yes. And the fact that we got asked to do Scary Movie 4, yes. So Mm -hmm. there was some of it out there. But just walking down the street, did I think people were like, oh, my God, Bridget. Yeah, not at this point. I did not think that. In fact, I didn't feel like people... like. Obviously, if you watch the show, you know who we are and know our names, but I didn't feel like the general public like knew our names. Like they might have recognized us as like, oh, the Playboy Bunnies or oh, Hef's Girlfriends. But I didn't really feel like based on the interactions I was having out in the wild that people knew our names until like season three. Yeah. Like I feel like on the level of cable show that we were on and just the fact that we were being associated with Playboy and not everybody wants to accept like a multiple girlfriend Playboy bunny. We had to prove that we were sticking around for a while for people to be finally be like, oh, okay. Yeah. You know? (laughs) Yeah. I know you specifically say category, but I wonder if anybody else is picking up on that because I think the way the show wants to frame it as like, Being on the cover of Playboy is the biggest thing you can do. I think they were trying to frame it that way too. But I specifically say that category, Mm -hmm. like just that section of my life, not the biggest thing you can do in your entire life. Because I know it wasn't your only goal or your biggest goal. And it reminds me of like season one when they cut me to say, Bridget thinks being a playmate would be achieving all in body and mind. (laughs) But that wasn't what I said. (laughs) Right. No, it's it's totally that same thing. Like they wanted to make it seem like that to me, Playboy is the highest possible goal you can have in life, period. Which I think does two things from the show's perspective. One, it elevates Playboy and makes it look like this is a big goal. And two, it kind of makes us look dumb. Like, those girls think being in Playboy is the biggest goal. (laughs) You know what I mean? Because I had never considered celebrity or, you know, TV show or, you know, reality star or any of those things. Mm -hmm. I never even thought of those things as being a possibility. Yeah, but you did have other goals. Like, remind people what those were just in case they're just tuning in now. Like, you had other goals with your degree. You wanted to open Halloween attractions and stuff like that. Like, you had plans. Right, yeah. (laughs) I really wanted to get into broadcast journalism. I love hosting. I mean, I was taking classes for all of that. I did want to do a Halloween store. I would love to do a Halloween store. Like there were so many things that I I had ideas for. So many different ways. I had plan A, B, C, D, mm-hmm. all kinds of different things. So yeah. And then I hated the, fl- the fake clapping. And then they did this little woo. 
<laughs> and I was Damn like, it. whose who was that? Did you notice when they cut back to footage from season one, they make it look so ancient? Like they put like a grainy yes. 70s filter over it? Yes. Which is smart because it tells you exactly what it is. Like this is last fucking year, but I think it's funny because they make it look ancient. <laughs> And, the, and then should you tell people what the weekend flash is? Because that's the copy you're reading. Right. It's a Playboy news show for like Playboy TV, but they flash at the end. Yeah. Playboy used to have a whole like cable channel and it was like nude stuff and they would have women like reading the news, but then they would like flash at the end, which you didn't flash for your, no. you were just reading the copy. Yeah. And I think some of the lines are funny, like why Iraq's got a lot of nerve. <laughs> yeah, well, they try to do a lot of it to be sexy or funny yeah. or tongue-in-cheek and cute. So you're getting, like, the news, but you're getting it in a very silly way with a lot of puns mm-hmm. and, like, funny things. Oh, and when I'm, like, keep messing up and everything, Kendra's like, that's what they do to me in sports all the time. It's true. It is true some of the times. Yeah. <laughs> what did they do that to me on? Just living life? <laughs> Uh, so the next scene, it's back in my room and I'm at my desk and I say my favorite part about all the success is that we've gotten a a few perks and Ellen, the butler calls and says, your car has arrived. (laughs) It's here on the property. And I was so excited. I scream. I, I say, thank you. And I go skipping out of the room. Explain what's going on here because I was confused because I remember you getting this car, but I didn't realize you had borrowed it at first. So what's going on? Yeah, so okay, it starts actually back further than this. So not too long prior to this happening, and it doesn't happen on camera, there is a party at the Playboy Mansion, and Porsche North America is one of the sponsors of it, and Mm -hmm. they have that car sitting at the mansion, and they're sponsoring a party. And I fell in love with it. I'd never seen the Cayman before. I don't even think it had been out yet, really. Is there something soothing to you about a Porsche? Like, even when I see the Porsche logo now, I feel like, I don't know. There's just something about the brand I like that's very soothing. Yeah, well, I just (laughs) fell in love. Like, I had never been, like, a a Porsche person before that, but I just fell in love with the Cayman S. It was so cute. You know what else I love about a Porsche, too, is they age well. Like, they don't, like, any era of Porsche, they look good. You never look at one and go, ugh, that looks chuggy. Yeah. True. No, you're right about that on the outside. But what I didn't like about my Porsche on the inside is that it didn't have all of the bells and whistles that it should have for the price of that car. Oh, bummer. Like it didn't have, you know, Bluetooth and like map technology. Wait, they had Bluetooth anything. back then? Yeah, it was the what start because there were for? there were things on my Mercedes that I had that like the the um, Porsche didn't have. What did people use Bluetooth for back then? Was it just like talking on your phone over the speakers? Speaker, yeah, all the speaker okay. use and everything. It didn't have like any way to play your own music. Like you had, it had like a tape deck still. Like everything was very a archaic tape in it. Deck, that's nuts. Yeah, and I heard that they've improved that now. But, I mean, it was really bad. Like, to the point where Weird. my Toyota, like, I had a Prius at the uh-huh. same time I had the Porsche. And my Prius had way better technology in it than the Porsche ever did. That's so interesting. hmm Huh. And it was annoying. Like, it just didn't have a lot of the stuff. But I loved this car mm-hmm. at this time. And that's why I ended up, what, not the only reason. There was a bunch of reasons. And reasons that you'd be very interested to know of why I had to... An, sell the car eventually but that was one of the reasons wait now I want to know is this something you have to tell us later in the timeline no because it happens way after I I, I mean I, I I held on to the car for a long time after What's I the, the interesting message. reasons so um I had the specialty plates on mm-hmm. it and people would follow me <gasps> I've been followed no. into garages. Ew. Yeah, like parking garages. I've been like chased down on the freeway. So eventually we do feel famous. Right. <laughs> but not yet. <laughs> and people are like being like totally like just to ask me for pictures. One guy was like, Laurel Canyon is a very uh, small two lane like road that goes through the canyon. Somebody Windy, was, dangerous. Somebody was driving alongside of me. No, 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 no. Because you guys, this is like dead man's curve up there. Like you could drive off the edge of the hill. Screaming at me something. To the point where I finally, like I was trying to ignore them. To the point where I was finally like, 
maybe there's something really wrong with my me or my car or something. And I rolled down That's my window. That's how they get you. And he was trying to ask me out. <laughs> like, it was just disgusting. Ew. It was bad. So that was the main reason a I had to, to get streets. rid of the car because even just changing the plates wouldn't have been enough. It was a very distinguishable car. Yeah, damn, and that sucks. Yeah. Anyway, back to why I loved the car. <laughs> I was so excited. Porsche had this party at the mansion. I saw the car. I fell in love with it. And they agreed to let me borrow it for a couple of weeks, which I thought was like, holy shit. Like, uh-huh. I didn't even know... They did that. Well, come to find out now, I know that car companies will do that. Oh, cool. Like like Jaguar let me borrow a car for do two you, weeks. Do you have to pay a little bit or no? Are they no, just No, they just you? drop oh, it wow. off at your house and they're like, have fun. Nice. Yeah. That's cool. So I didn't, but I didn't know at this time that mm-hmm. that was a thing you could do. So when they were like, we'll let you borrow it for a couple of weeks, I think they're hoping you're going to fall in love with mm-hmm. it and like want it. Which is exactly what happened. Yeah. But they drop it off at the house and I totally love it. Can I just say it's raining when they drop the car off and it's just like the coziest day. It totally is. It's coming up the the driveway. It's all wet. I'm in my little sweats hoodie and I'm like so excited. One of the first things it shows is it shows your hand on Porsches have like a front trunk. Yeah, a frunk. I I know. I only recently learned that word, frunk. Yeah. It's so funny. And I get in and I'm talking about how cute it is. And when you say it purrs like a kitten, was that dubbed in? (laughs) No, I think I really really? was. Yeah, Uh, because the sound you hear on the car is not the real sound of the car. The car really does have this like purring sound. uh Uh-huh. Like it's amazing. And this, like I said, this was a studio rental car. It was not my actual car. I ended up getting one. This one had like a very brown orangey mm-hmm. interior I got one that had a black interior and actually I'll just give a shout out because they had me go to Rustnik Porsche it's in Pasadena and they had me custom order everything that Fun. I wanted on it and they did all of that and um, because Porsche North America was working with Playboy and advertising with them and stuff they gave me like a special deal or Hef a special deal or whatever and before you guys think Hef just outright bought the car for me he did not <laughs> he gives us a deposit for a car and then he makes the monthly payments but then as soon as you leave the mansion whatever's left on that is yours yeah so people had moved out before and got their cars straight up repossessed yeah because they just weren't prepared for what the payment was so I was prepared for this so when we did move out of the mansion I was prepared to just pay it off in total Mm -hmm. as we moved out of the mansion so I didn't have because the monthly payment on that car was like 1200 bucks or something Mm -hmm. so it was a lot not to mention the insurance Mm -hmm. (laughs) but it was so cute and it purred like a kitten yeah so as soon as it got there I knew I didn't want to give it back and they show me getting in the car and they make it look like I don't know how to use this car or whatever but the ignition was on a different side of the car than it is on my Mercedes well I feel like that's relatable I feel like anytime you get in a new car like anytime I have to rent a car for whatever reason it takes me a second like I'm sitting in that driveway like where the fuck is everything even still to my car in my cars these days that I've had for like a couple years like I'm still going to the owner's manual or like looking shit up it's just like every car is different yeah I don't think it's dumb yeah so the ignition is on the left on that car when usually it's on the right or it was for the cars that I'd had in the past and then they start playing like a Jeopardy type music like I can't figure it out dumb they did that to me season one there was uh-huh. something in my Porsche that I was like in my Cayenne that I was like Ooh. I think I asked you what is this used for and you were yeah. like I don't know it was like for off-roading how the fuck would I know <laughs> yeah and it wasn't like excessive time went by but they yeah. make it look like it was yeah yeah we're just too dumb to have the cars that we have you know I know too stu- we don't deserve it <laughs> and I noticed too that I'm wearing um this rain jacket that I had with a Jack Daniels patch on it. I noticed that too. Was that from the promo days? 
Yes and no. So that was my jacket. That was not a Jack Daniels mm-hmm. jacket, but I wore it on promos when I had to because we would do like the Raiders games and they're freezing cold mm-hmm. sometimes. And those were patches that we would hand out and I put one on the jacket. Oh, it's a cute jacket. Yeah. I like it. But it's not a, a Jack Daniels jacket, but it was back from my promo days and it's so funny. And they showed Gizmo on Wednesday. Like they're like dancing in the Aww. window trying to look out. They make it look like they're trying to look out to see the new car, but... Your window's facing the other way. My window's yeah. facing the the backyard and not that and then it cuts to holly's vanity okay can i just say well this is one of the reasons i hate this episode so much is i am horrified by what a f- i am about your car <laughs> did you notice that yes were you offended by that back in the day be honest back i don't think i really felt it back in the day but watching it back i was like damn yeah, you're like what is wrong with you like i don't so it back in the real time i don't know what you're saying in your interview uh-huh. and i don't know how you really feel about it or anything like that until we watch the episodes and usually when we watch the episodes back we're more concerned back in those days about us being embarrassed right so i feel like we're not even picking up on the nuances that we are today but watching it back I was like damn Holly was like a hater about it no I walked I watched this back from my YouTube and I was like what the f is wrong with me Jesus Christ I felt so bad in fact the reason I put you driving in the red Porsche in the intro is I'm like for our YouTube is I'm like I have to redeem myself for those car comments I'm so sorry for like dogging on your car (laughs) so I hate this scene but also, um, I think they're playing our personalities against each other because literally you are jumping up and down with yes. excitement. And I'm very stoic, which I am all the time. Resting bitch face. Like I'm on the spectrum. So I have like what they call flat effect, meaning like I always have resting bitch face. My voice is very monotone. And I feel like they're playing that up even more in this scene. Like when you come up to my vanity to get me, you're saying, oh, I got this Porsche. And you can hear me say, oh, cool. But they like turn the volume I way noticed that. Down. Yeah. They want to make it look like I'm not saying anything. Yeah. Also, we're wearing the same outfit, which is so random. I know. It's like this black Playboy tracksuit, and I don't think it was planned. I think we were just randomly both in the same outfit that day. I feel like we must have both just gotten them. I think so. And, and we're like, oh, these are cute, day. and it's a cozy, rainy day. Yeah. Also, I just recently um, got my autism diagnosis, and I used this episode as something I was telling my therapist about. Because she's like, have you ever gotten, you know, they ask if you get feedback about your personality or how you act to different things. And I was telling her that it's been so helpful to me to like watch these episodes back because I can see how I'm acting and how that doesn't necessarily reflect how I'm feeling. And this episode is the perfect example because I'm standing outside looking at your car and I'm excited you got the car. I think it's cute. I love Porsches, but I'm just there like playing with my hair. You can see there's a moment where like an extension falls out and I'm trying to like get it out of my hair. Yeah. And, but they're playing it up very much. Like you're jumping up and down and I'm just like, like I'm mad about it, which I wasn't mad about it. It's just like, this is me. And that's how I express myself. And then they cut to the confessional and they're asking me, why are you not very excited about Bridget's car? And at the time, like now that I'm more educated about how I am, I'm like, I was excited about it. It's just, I don't show it when I'm like, I'm happy for her. She got the car, but like, I I don't express myself the way you do. I'm not going to jump up and down. It's just not what I do. But back then they're in the interview asking me, Holly, why are you not excited about Bridget's car? So I'm thinking, damn, am I not excited about Bridget's car? Why am I not excited about Bridget's car? So I'm trying to come up with reasons. And I'm like, well, you know, I live in Beverly Hills. I see nice cars all the time. Like, I don't know, maybe I'm just jaded. Like, it's a cute car, but I'm not going to jump up and wet my pants over it. (laughs) But I feel so bad because it comes off so f***ing mean. Yeah. I'm sorry I dogged on your car. It's okay. I'll (laughs) forgive you. But I am so excited about it, as you can tell. And mm-hmm. I go and tell everybody. But you know what? Other people were excited about it, too. I know they make yeah. it look like I'm dragging everybody out. But, mm-hmm. like, people are like, let me know when the car gets here. Yeah. Like, other people were in on it and wanted to come and see the car. It wasn't just me, like, dying to get everybody out there. So, but I do get everyone out there. I have Mary come out. And I have uh, Monica. And I jump up and down in, in Kendra's room and wake her up and make her come <laughs> down and look. And. And um, she was being nice about it. She was into the car. Yeah. Kendra was totally into the car. And it's one of those times where I'm like, damn, this is when like very supportive of each other. And yeah, season two is very up and down. 
Yeah, but this is one of those examples uh-huh. of her being like supportive of it because she could just as easily have been she snotty could- about it or just not cared. And I loved Mary's comment. I go in there and I tell her, I'm like, it purrs like a kitten. And she says, are you going to get it a Saiyan Vosh? <laughs> She's so funny. I have a question. Who's Petra? Because in commentary, we're talking about Petra. Like it's this big funny joke having to do with the car. And I'm like, who is Petra? I don't know. There was a playmate from the 80s named Petra who still like worked playmate promotions at the time. Were we talking about her? Was it somebody testing? I don't know. What did we say about her? I don't remember. It was just something like, oh, and Petra was excited too. And Petra. And I'm like, what? <laughs> I don't know. But I love how you are so excited about the car because I think it really draws the viewer in and it gets the viewer excited too. Well, I was definitely, this is all genuine, you guys. Like I was 100% so excited about this car. Uh I was 100% hoping that driving it for a couple weeks that Hef would like let me get it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know at this time if I was going to get it for real, but I just thought I was so lucky to be able to drive it for like two weeks. Yeah. How cool was it that they were going to let me do that? Mm -hmm. they trusted me to do that and I was just like I was beside myself over this car like I just thought it was incredible I love cars though like I love sports cars I really really love them um Kendra says it looks like a Ferrari and I got that from a lot of people a lot of people thought it looked like a Ferrari yeah I can see that people would ask me sometimes because this was like a new model for the Porsche it was a brand new model yeah brand new model for it and everywhere I went people would be like what what kind of car is that or like how do you like that car because like no one had it yet like I feel like I was like the first one to get it because before they just had the Boxster and the 911 and then they came out with the Cayenne the SUV and then this was like the new shape sports car Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm And then Kendra was like, if I got that Porsche, it'd be like, woo. And I don't know what she means by that. (laughs) What does that mean? (laughs) I get it. But I get it too, but I don't know what it means exactly. Like, I don't know how to explain that. (laughs) And then I tell her I want to get rims with a bunny in the middle. So I already have plans for when I own this car that I'm Mm -hmm. not going to own at this point. anyway. And then Kendra says, I think she deserves it. It fits her and it's perfect for her. Thanks, Kendra. (laughs) At least somebody's being supportive. (laughs) That's right. Because I'm telling (laughs) Holly how excited I am. (laughs) And then I'm like, who else can I tell? And then here comes half. And in an interview, I talk about how important it is for me to get Hef to like the Porsche because, mm-hmm. you know, I need him to approve of it. He's going to want to see it in the driveway. Yeah. For people that might not understand, why might Hef not approve it? Would the payments have been a little higher than what you were driving at the time? Because you yeah. had the Mercedes? Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, the payments were way higher than the Mercedes. Okay. The Mercedes was something I got not, well, I forget how long after I moved in. I think we talked about this already, though, and I figured it out then. But it was very much a lower payment okay so this was an upgrade for sure okay and then hef like is in the driver's seat and i'm like you look hot in this car and then he gets out (laughs) and walks away and he says looks like a keeper which i don't know if he knew how important those words were (laughs) do you think that he knew that by saying that he was basically saying that i was i was going to be able to get the car or do you think he was just saying that as like something somebody says in passing no i think he already i i got the feeling like i remember back then not thinking it was like a stressful thing thinking like oh she'll get the car like no problem I feel like he kind of already knew and was clued in especially since they were filming it like oh Bridget really wants this car like he was probably prepped yeah because I feel like I wasn't I did not think (laughs) I was necessarily going to get this car so when he said it was a keeper like then I'm telling everybody he said it was a keeper he said it was a keeper he said it was did you hear him say it Holly heard him say it I know Holly heard him say it (laughs) and I'm just literally like bouncing up and down the whole time and um and it, and it cuts to a montage of me like bouncing mm-hmm. up and down. And then the next scene, side hill of the mansion, Kendra is standing in my open door and it looks like we're getting ready to like walk down and go do something. I can see that I have all my packing going on in the background because we're clearly getting ready to leave for Europe. Yeah, so we already know about Europe at this point. But it hasn't been mentioned mm-hmm. in the show yet. And Kendra is standing at my open door and... The phone rings. It's Norma. And she says, it's okay for me to get the car. Yay. Victory. Yeah. I'm obviously screaming, jumping up and down again. <laughs> and I tell Norma, thank you, thank you, thank you. And Norma says, well, you're thanking the wrong person. And then Hef gets on the phone and he says, you're very welcome, sweetheart. And 
I say in commentary that it's so exciting to hear, but even 20 years later watching that back, like I still felt all that excitement. That well, I no, felt I feel like your enthusiasm is so good on the show because it really draws the viewer in. Yeah, but I'm just saying like 20 yeah. years later, <laughs> hearing that phone call and Norma saying you could get the car, mm-hmm. I'm like, yes, all yeah. over again. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Um, and Kendra and I are just both like, oh my God. Um, I call my I have to call my mom because I always have to call my mom mm-hmm. about everything and tell her. And then my stepdad asks, is Winnie excited about this? And they show Winnie just like plopping her head down and being like, wah, wah, wah. Yeah. <laughs> and Winnie falls asleep on my pink toolkit. Do you remember those pink toolkits we got? I still have a pink toolkit. I probably have mine too in storage somewhere. I only for my houses get pink toolkits. And even when I was married, I would get an extra pink toolkit because tools would go missing. And I'd be like, no, no, you guys, no. These Not are, my pink ones. Yeah, nobody would nobody would touch the pink ones. Yeah. <laughs> so looking back on your experience while you were at the mansion, being on TV, being in the public eye, if you could go back and just kind of like make everything perfect and like clean everything up, what would you make different for yourself as far as like career or experiences you were allowed to have? Or is there anything you wish you could have done differently? I mean, obviously there were a lot of experiences that I'm sure I had to miss because of our curfew Mm -hmm. or the Playboy's rules or whatever. I remember there were certain, like we talked about earlier, appearances that I couldn't do because Playboy didn't want me to. There were um, horror movies that I wanted to audition for Mm -hmm. that I wasn't able to do. There was definitely hosting opportunities that I wish I could have gone out for that just wouldn't have fit the timeline because I'm not allowed to leave the mansion. Yeah. So there's definitely things that I wish I could have done at the time and taken advantage of the popularity that we were having Mm -hmm. to have done things back then um, that I wasn't able to. Yeah, it's kind of hard to answer because as you're answering I'm kind of thinking of like what what are my things and it's almost like I don't even know what could have been or what could have been available because we didn't have our own agents managers PR people we didn't know what the opportunities could have been like we can look at our peers at that time who are also on reality TV and what they got to do and it's just like worlds different from what we got to do like we got a bunch of great opportunities but it's almost like we'll never know what could have been Yeah, and I think what people don't realize, too, is it wasn't only just, like, so, like, uh, say, like, the Palms didn't want us to do appearances at other places other than the Palms. Mm -hmm. So there was that kind of thing. Playboy didn't want us doing other things that that wasn't Playboy. But then E didn't want us doing things that wasn't E either. So like I got a thing, when I got the VH1 Celebrity Paranormal Project, they didn't want to let me do that at first. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. Yeah, it was like a big deal. Mm, Interesting. And even like the Travel Channel later on, like it was a big deal to like, because it wasn't E. Everything had to stay with E. So there's a lot of opportunities that we weren't able to do and in as far as hosting and stuff goes, me specifically mm-hmm. was not able to do because of all of those different things that, you know, Playboy doesn't want you doing it. The Palms doesn't want you doing it. E doesn't want you doing it. Wh- whoever, you yeah. know, there was all these people that had their hands in the pot that didn't want us pursuing other opportunities. Yeah, that's crazy. I feel like by the time the show came along, I was so like mentally locked into the mansion world and had been so like not allowed to do anything from like day one that I wasn't really trying to do outside stuff. But again, it's like I know so much more would have been possible if we would have been allowed to have like outside representation and yeah. do our own PR and kind of like craft our own image. So it's crazy. But I think we've made lemonade out of lemons. But at the time <laughs> too, I was happy with Playboy PR. I was happy with the things that they got us. I thought we were getting a lot of things. And I bet there's a lot of things that I don't even know that they turned down for me. Oh, certainly. I remember one thing I really wanted to do toward the end was the first ever Celebrity Apprentice, and they wouldn't let me do it, but they let Tiffany Fallon do it. Yeah. And I, like, I love Tiffany Fallon, and I'm totally supportive of like anything she wants to do, like totally rooting for her. But I thought it was kind of cheap how like the offer came to me. They said, no, she can't do it. Oh, but take our Playmate of the Year. It's like, okay. Yeah. That was rude. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, we will be back next week with the rest of this Career Dazed episode. And if you want more content, be sure to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash girlsnextlevel. And we'll see you guys next week. Bye, guys. Bye.
For more content, check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash girlsnextlevel.